Hello, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Pet McDonald, and in this video, we'll be learning the three to five player game Fool's Gold, designed by Joshua Balvin and published by Passport Game Studios. It's 1848, and gold has just been discovered in California. Over the next five years, you'll be taking on the role of a wealthy investor, sending miners into the diverse regions of the landscape. But be wary, for all that glitters is not gold. So come join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, first place the game board in the center of the table. Each player then chooses a color and takes the matching player screen, six coins, and a number of minor meeples depending on the number of players. Two miners of their color in a five player game, three miners in a four player game, and four miners in a three player game, which we'll be setting up for here. Place your coins and miners behind your player screen, as these will be hidden information during the game. Separate the cards into the five different mining location decks, shuffle them, and place each onto the matching spaces of the board. Place the 10 blue prospecting dice into the middle of the game board. Then set the remaining coins and the white winter die beside the board in a general supply. Finally, place an additional miner for each player color on the date spaces at the bottom of the board, leaving the 1849 space empty. Place coins equal to the number of players underneath each of those spaces. Then give the first player token to the player with the most gold teeth. Or decide one randomly. And that's the setup. In Fool's Gold, you'll be using your miners in an attempt to uncover more wealth than your opponents over the course of five rounds, each representing a passing year. Each round is divided into two phases, starting with the prospecting phase. At the beginning of this phase, the first player rolls all of the prospecting dice. You'll notice that each of the paths leading up to a mine are marked with a number. Any dice that have rolled that number are placed onto that path, starting with the space showing the die, and continuing in ascending order with each space holding no more than one die. It's important to note that dice will not be placed onto any of the red spaces at this time. If enough of the same number are rolled that you would need to place onto the three position, instead, change the die to a six and set it in the middle area of the board. These dice, as well as any other that have rolled sixes, are considered wild, and you'll be able to use these dice later. Now it's time to take actions, starting with the first player. On your turn, you must take one of the four available actions. Let's take a look at those now. One option is to place a miner from your supply onto any available mining space. A space is considered available as long as there is at least one die located in that mine. Empty mines are inaccessible. You also cannot choose a space already occupied by another miner or die. After placing a miner, pay coins equal to the value shown on that space. In Fool's Gold, coins that are spent are not placed back into the general supply. Instead, simply place them in front of your player screen. At the end of a round, you'll be returning all spent coins back behind your screen. Think of it like a yearly budget. Another action you may choose to take is moving one of the wild dice from the center of the board to a mine. Unlike miners who may be placed into any available space in the chosen mine, the wild dice is always placed into the lowest available one. You may even select a mine that has no dice in it at all, placing the wild die onto the first space and opening the mine up for miners to be placed there on future turns. You then pay coins equal to the number of dice at that location, excluding the one you just played. For example, the first die played here would cost you zero. Placing another here on a future action would cost one, and so on. You always ignore the value shown on a space when placing a die. Those costs apply only to miners. And remember, coins you pay are placed in front of your screen. The third action you can take is to place one of your unused miners in front of your screen to retrieve three of your spent coins, sending them back behind your screen and allowing you to use them again this round. And finally, you may use your action to pass, forfeiting any further turns for that round. When passing, you'll take any unused miners from behind your screen and place them out onto the board beside any mines of your choice, like this. These are referred to as reserve miners. You may place them together or divide them as you wish between the different mines, but there is no limit to the number of reserve miners that can be at a location. We'll talk in a moment about the difference between regular and reserve miners. Finally, when passing, return all of your spent coins back behind your player screen. After a player has completed a single action, the player to their left will now take their turn. This continues clockwise until all players have passed. At that point, the prospecting phase has ended and the mining phase begins. First, you'll shuffle each of the mine decks and then resolve each mine in numerical order starting with the hills. Count the number of miners on the path to the mine and multiply it by the number of dice located there. Don't include the miners that have been placed into reserve. 
So for example, we have three miners here as well as three dice, which totals nine. Now we reveal, one at a time, that many cards from the top of the deck. Normally I'd keep drawing up to nine, but let's stop here and take a look at the different card types you'll encounter. Each of the locations has different quantities of gold, as shown by the mine profile on the back of your player's screen, with each nugget of gold being worth one point at the end of the game. They also have a number of silt, gems, false alarm, and foul weather cards. Silt are worthless cards and cannot be claimed. Each of the five locations hold a specific kind of gem. At the end of the game, you'll gain an increasing number of points depending on how many different gems you have. You can only ever have one of each type of gem, so at most, this could earn you 15 points. If a foul weather card is revealed while drawing, reduce the total number of cards to be drawn by one. For example, if I was revealing four cards, and the second one drawn was a foul weather, I would now only reveal one more card for a total of three. If foul weather is the final card drawn, it can simply be ignored. Lastly, are false alarms. After all the required cards have been revealed, combine any false alarms, gold, and gems. Then shuffle them together and randomly select a number of them equal to the number of false alarms that were revealed. Those selected cards are returned to the bottom of that mine deck. The rest of the cards are returned to the pile that you have drawn, ignoring any false alarms that may remain. Players will now use their miners in that location to take mining actions. The player with the most miners at that location will be the first to take an action. This is where reserve miners become important, because although they will not be able to take actions themselves, they will count towards your total number of miners at that location. For example, the yellow player here has two miners, meaning they will select first. If players are tied for total miners, the miner on the highest valued space on that location will act first. Now a player uses their miner to take one of the gold or gem cards that have been revealed. Once claimed, these cards are kept hidden behind your player screen. As mentioned before, you can only have one of each type of gem. So for example, if I already owned a garnet, I would not be able to take another one. After taking a card, the miner you use is sent back behind your player screen. A miner can instead be used to claim two coins from the bank. You then return it behind your player screen along with the coins. This will give you more coins to spend on future rounds. The last option you have is to set your miner on its side to prepare for winter. A miner on its side no longer counts towards the number of miners you have at that location. After the miner with majority has taken their action, you recheck for majority and that player will use one of their miners, meaning the same player might get more than one action in a row. Continue this way until all miners at that location are either back behind their player screens or set on their side. At this point, we'll move on to Winter, first returning any remaining revealed cards to the bottom of the location deck. Now check again for which miner has priority at this location, including the miners which are on their side. Whichever player has the lowest priority will roll the white Winter die that we set aside earlier. The number rolled on this die indicates the number of cards which will be turned over from the top of the location deck. This is completed in the same way as before, resolving foul weather and false alarms as needed. Starting with the highest priority, players will again have a chance to use their miners in order to collect gold or gems which have been revealed. However, once in winter, you can no longer use your miners to collect coins or choose to set them on their side. Once winter is over, even if you weren't able to collect anything, all of your miners from that location are sent back behind your player screen including the reserve miners. You will repeat this process for the other four mines in ascending order until all miners have been placed back behind the player screens. At that point, the year has ended and it's time to start the next round. Pass the first player token to the left and then take the miners and coins from the next year on the round tracker, passing one of each to every player. Once you reach the end of the fifth round, it is time for scoring. First, divide all gold nuggets that you've earned into piles, one for each location deck. For each location in which you found no gold nuggets, you will lose five points. Now total the values of each pile. Whichever pile has the most gold nuggets will not count towards your final score. This pile is considered to be your fool's gold. Add together all the nuggets from the remaining piles, with each nugget counting as one point. Now check to see how many gems you gained during the game. If you had one type of gem, you gain one point, all the way up to 15 points for having one of each kind of gem. Add these points together with your nuggets to find your total. The player with the highest score is the winner. In the case of a tie, players will count the number of nuggets in their highest valued pile, other than their fool's gold. The highest value will be declared the winner. If the tie persists, continue checking your next highest pile until a winner is decided. And that's everything you need to know to play Fool's Gold. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.